Biloxi, Mississippi. Monday, September 14, 1987. It was a typically warm summer night in this quiet Gulf Coast town. The workday was over and most residents had retreated to the tranquility of their homes. Like most of their neighbors, State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor. Both were fixtures at Biloxi's social and community functions. They were a happy couple who had raised three grown children. Tomorrow they planned to visit their daughter out of state. Their life together seemed ideal. They were just settling in for the night when an unexpected visitor came to the door. brought their perfect world to an end. The Sherrys were supposed to be with their daughter. So no one realized anything was wrong until two days later when the judge failed to show up in court on Wednesday, September 16th. Calls to the Sherry's home went unanswered. His colleagues at the court phoned Pete Halat, Vincent Sherry's friend and former law partner. Morning, Pete Halat. But he hadn't seen or heard from the judge either. Well, he's supposed to be in court. When did he leave? I don't know. No, wait, you let me call him at home and I'll, I'll figure out where he is. After he left a concerned message on the Sherry's answering machine, Halat felt he'd better check on his friend personally. Oh, I got the machine. Judge! Judge, it's Pete. They're looking for you in court. Is everything okay? On his way out, he asked his junior partner, Charles Legier, yeah. to ride with him. Charlie, hold on. Time to settle up. And I need some help, so let's go. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Listen, I'll give you a call back, okay? Yeah. Bye-bye. Right, I figure if we go together, the two of us... As they drove, Legier the tried to make conversation. Well, that seemed distant, perhaps concerned about the judge. Both of the Sherry's cars stood in the driveway. Well, the car's here. Halat asked Legier to go to the house while he asked a neighbor if she'd seen the couple. Legier rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He saw that the last two morning newspapers hadn't been picked up. The neighbor told Halat she hadn't seen the Sherrys for a couple of days, which she thought was odd since both of their cars were in the driveway. When Legier tried the Sherry's door, he found it unlocked. Something wasn't right. Hey, Pete! Pete! Uh, just knocking on him, the door opened up. concerned by the open door, cautiously stepped inside. A 
A few steps in, he made the gruesome discovery. Judge Sherry had been gunned down in his own home. He was wrong. They called the police. Authorities arrived to find the body of Vincent Sherry at the front of the house. In the back bedroom, they discovered Margaret. Because the couple was so prominent, the murder investigation became top priority. Detectives contacted the FBI's Biloxi field office. Though the FBI would not yet be officially involved, they offered the use of their agents and forensic laboratories. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. They conducted blood spatter analysis to determine projectile angles. If they could figure out where the murderer had stood when he fired the shots, they might be able to reconstruct the crime. Okay. Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, help process the scene. He discovered a possible clue in the den. There was blood trailing from his feet, actually going down between his legs a little ways, uh, back to where he was laying. There was blood spatter on um, a double sliding glass door that was right beyond his head. And for other examination in this room, I found some uh, small pieces of foam rubber. Burris didn't see where the foam rubber could have come from. A search of the house led him to one conclusion. Now this foam rubber had to have been brought into the house. We examined every piece of material in this house and every room of the house, all pillows, mattresses, everything else. There's no foam rubber tore up in this house. It was brought into the house. It does have gunshot residue on it. And basically about the only way it can get there is for a bullet to be fired through it. For Burris, the significance of the foam rubber was obvious. The killer had used a homemade silencer. Investigators dusted for fingerprints, but found none of any value. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol, as well as the bullets used to murder the Sherrys. The position of the shells indicated that the shots had been fired in rapid succession. But most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. Nothing at the scene pointed to the killer's identity. So what do you think? He did his job well, and his mission was clear. 